This is Andrea Kane, and I am here for HIT 330. This is week one of health, uh, how do I want to say this, sorry, healthcare delivery systems, and we are going to be focusing on chapter two over the next seven weeks. So as a result, there are 62 slides total in this slide deck, and I am only going to be focusing this week one on those of delivery of healthcare. We will come back and go over these slides again each week over the next seven weeks as it applies. So with that in mind, let's move forward and move on. All right, the United States healthcare system has a wide range of services. And you will notice if you're in multiple um, HIT courses that we start with the healthcare delivery system in almost every class and kind of go back to that. I like to describe it as a seven layer salad. We don't do a one and done. We don't, we don't tell you something once and then let it go. What we try to do is layer it. We give you some now and some next semester and some the semester after that and some more the semester after that and we go over it. It's like evaluating a diamond and looking at the different facets, looking at the color, looking at the quality, looking at the ring mount, looking at the history of the stone, all of that. Because when we finish, we want you to have a really good idea and a, a very wide understanding of these topics. So I realize that you are a first year student. This is HIT 330, and so this is a first class for you. So we're gonna do some touching um, on some things that you will come back to. But I wanna just um, choose the things that have to do with week one in our course and go from there. So our healthcare system, there's um, preventative care, there are complex procedures, there's inpatient, there's outpatient, there's long-term care, there's home health, there's hospice, there's substance abuse treatment, there is detox treatment um, for, um, for other issues, there's mental health, there is rehab, inpatient and outpatient, there are sp specific specialties, if I can get that out, specific specialties that happen. We begin with contact with the healthcare system and it's usually on an individual basis. It starts at birth and continues through death. Our healthcare system in the United States employs about 16 million workers, or at least that was the most recent estimate. That probably is going to change with COVID, um, so expect some fluctuation with that. I'm going to skip this slide, we'll come back to it, and this one as well, and this one, and this one, um, and this one. We will also skip this one, and this one, and I guess we'll stop here for a moment. Integrated delivery systems. Um, this is really what modern hospitals and healthcare organizations have grown into. If you go back in history, back in the day to the late 1800s, early 1900s, hospitals um, were often in a house. And before that, all healthcare took place usually in the home. Um, there were some differences in large cities. Um, there were hospitals established well before that, but the original hospital, so to speak, was your home and the doctor came to you or the healthcare professional um, in your area or your village came to you. It might even be a family member um, if there were no one else available. Then over time, hospitals were built. Um, again, they started in ho houses with different rooms and then eventually specific buildings were built as hospitals. And then over time, people realized that more healthcare than just a hospital setting was needed, that patients could be treated on an outpatient basis. Maybe they come in for a specific type of a clinic. Um, maybe they have respiratory issues and they would come in and see the doctor for the respiratory issue in his home or in his clinic and those types of things. And then over time there became nursing homes and other types of care settings. Um, there were hospitals for those with behavioral health issues. There were hospitals um, for those who were intellectually disabled and could not care for themselves and their families could not care for them. 
Um, and that, that all grew. And then there became healthcare systems that owned all of these different types of things in the particular area. And that's what they're talking about with these integrated delivery systems that you might go to one provide one organization and get from birth to death care. And that's also the continuum of care. It is not just getting sick and being treated, but what happens afterwards and how do you get back to health or how do you maintain your health afterwards? What kind of care provides that? And integrated delivery networks grew as well, meaning that a patient could be born in a hospital that was owned by a corporation or a company or a group or a county or what have you. And then all of their care, whether it was a physician in the office, whether it was a hospitalization visit, whether it was emergency department, um, all the way up to a nursing home, um, even retirement communities. I worked for an organization that had a retirement community where they had everything from cottages all the way up to a memory unit and skilled nursing care. Um, so you had that. That's an integrated delivery network where it's all owned and cared for and um, provided by the same owners, so to speak. Health expenditures in the United States are reaching, if not exceeding, $3.5 trillion and 17.9% of the total American economy. Lots has been written about this, and if you are interested, I'd encourage you to go out and Google health expenditures by country and take a look at some of the differences. That is not to say others do better than the U.S. or worse than the U.S. or that America is the best or not the best. I'm not into politics and that's not what I'm here for. What I'm saying is that these are facts that, that health expenditures in, in the United States are expensive and they take quite a bit of our gross national product, our GNP. And that is not a good thing from an economic standpoint if you look at economic principles. There are a myriad of reasons behind this. Please understand this. This is not evil corporations. This is not evil government. This is not evil, evil anywhere. There are a number of reasons why we have reached what we have in the United States. And it is one of those places where unraveling those is going to be very difficult. Um, perhaps even impossible, but very, very difficult because some of these things that are the causes and the underlying reasons for how healthcare in the United States costs and is reimbursed are very deeply entrenched. And there's a lot of emotion involved with that, not just facts and not just um, numbers and best practices and things like that. So we will tiptoe around that for now and move on. Hospitals have an organized medical staff. They provide permanent medical staff. They offer round-the-clock nursing service, provide diagnostic and therapeutic services, and they are mostly acute care based. And your book will really go through a lot of this for you, and we will talk about inpatient care later. Um, in a, uh, I think that's week four or five that we get into that, perhaps. So I'm going to skip by some of these about modern hospitals because we will come back to those, including classifications and safety nets versus critical access hospitals and organization and that type of thing. But this is a good visual that just kind of gives you an idea of what most hospitals, how they are organized. And I'm not going to talk about board of directors or medical staff or administrative staff. Um, not going to talk about um, a lot of these services because we will come back to these. But I do want to pause for a minute to talk about managed care. Managed care is actually a reimbursement system that manages cost, quality, and access to services. And there are different types of managed care. Their goals are con to control cost increase access or control access depends on what the managed care goal is because some want to increase access and others want to control access to control costs and then promote high quality. They negotiate fees and again they do everything to control access. 
we will talk about managed care specifically in a different week. So again, we'll come back. ACOs, that's something we'll talk about as well. There are private medical practices. There are medical homes. You've probably heard of patient-centered medical homes, PCHMHs, and we'll talk about those as well. Hospital-based versus community-based. Public health services. We will definitely spend some time on public health services. I think, I think we spend a week on that. There is so much to discuss. There's home care, voluntary agencies, subacute care, long-term care, uh, behavioral health care, substance abuse care. There have been lots of biomedical and technological advances in medicine, and that has a significant impact on the delivery of health care in the United States. We are one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world in terms of what we develop and how we use it. We are not the most, however. You will find, and hopefully um, as you go through the program, you'll see that there are other interesting things happening around the world um, where they are also doing some innovating, perhaps not with biomedical or with technology, but with processes and how they approach um, care of patients. But there's also biomedical and technological advances being um, and being pursued in other areas of the world. Telehealth has become huge, especially with COVID. We are using telehealth as we have never used telehealth before to reach out to those who are in rural areas or those who should not be coming into the hospital to provide care to them. And then there's electronic health records and data and how that has played a role in all of this. Healthy People 2020 is a initiative from formerly the Institute of Medicine in which their goal is a society in which all people live long and healthy lives. And that's a great ideal. Um, how do you bring that down to earth though? How do you give that dream legs and feet on the ground so that it turns into reality? And that's where they are trying to look at health equity, eliminating disparities, and improving health. They're trying to look at social and physical environments and promote the ones that are good for people. They are looking at quality of life, healthy development, healthy behaviors, and trying to get people to um, adopt those. Um, looking at how to prevent disease, disability, injury, and premature death. And then understanding social determinants of health. What is happening in the environment and age range that impacts someone's health, functioning, quality of life, outcomes, and risks? An example of a social determinant is if someone doesn't have a good income and they are constantly worried about food. Let's say someone has type 2 diabetes, which is heavily dependent upon diet to control it. And then you have someone who has very little money very little income, very few resources, and, and they may live in an area that does not have good access to fresh fruits and vegetables um, or lean meats, things that they need to eat to be healthier. And that is a social determinant. That's, that's something that's socially happening to the patient that influences their health. And that's something that is being investigated and people are coming up with ideas of how they can help patients who are in this type of a situation. Excuse me, <clears throat> need to take a drink here. I have some iced tea. <clears throat> that's my go-to drink. And um, they're trying to help these people. And that's what this initiative is. You have the National Academy of Medicine reports um, to err as human is really one that we will insist that you read before you finish the HIT program because it is, it is bedrock to what happened in healthcare to bring quality to the forefront. Um, the research that went into that is phenomenal and how it changed the course of healthcare in the United States by focusing on quality is truly amazing really worthwhile and um, we will definitely be wanting to talk about that and then there's these others that have really good information in them as well 
Um, we have the CDC. You've probably been hearing a lot about the CDC with COVID. They do an enormous amount of work, not just when it comes to pandemics and those types of things, but what they monitor and how they reach out and provide information to not only organizations, but individuals. Local, state, and federal policies all impact healthcare delivery. Um, we see that right now in a COVID environment about who has to wear a mask and where do they have to wear a mask and about the cleaning that's required. Have you, got, have you gone to a hair salon lately? Have you uh, visited a restaurant lately? Have you gone to Walmart lately? And have you noticed anything different based on local, state, or federal policies that could potentially impact healthcare or healthcare delivery? Patient-centered outcomes has really taken off. Looking at the patient, instead of what's convenient for the physician or the provider, or what's convenient for the hospital or the other organization providing care, looking at the patient. From the patient's standpoint, what do they need? What do they want? And how is healthcare tailored to them? Um, we can go back to Social Security. I'm gonna encourage you to look back in your book and take a look at this information about the history behind healthcare delivery systems because they can explain it far better than I can. So I'm going to move through these slides. If we need to, we will come back to them when we talk about Medicare and Medicaid. And we will definitely talk about HIPAA and ARRA. We will talk about affordable care. And that is it for the slides. So this is week one, and I will be back week two to talk to you about federal and state. We will focus on federal and state as it um, touches on healthcare delivery systems. So read chapter two in your book, at least the parts about healthcare delivery this week. You will have um, a discussion, two assignments and the syllabus review, and then you are good to go for this week and we will start with next week. Take care, hope you're doing well, hope you're settling in, getting organized, and I know that we are going to have an awesome semester together, and I can't wait for all, to hear all of what you're learning and what you're thinking and what your experiences have been and how that will help us all grow in this class. All right, I'm going to let you go now. Take care.